Hi, I'm Dubba. I'm the director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF Podcast. This week, Daniel Ray is the head of innovation for Ultimate Guitar. You may well have their Tabs app on your phone. His is a fascinating story that brings to its logical conclusion a legacy of three generations in computer science for the US military and NASA to a groundbreaking music notation company in Russia with a user base roughly in the same ballpark as Spotify. His current main project is to create one billion musicians in the world. That's billion with a B. As part of that quest, Daniel joined us at the MTF Labs in Frankfurt, where I took him aside for an in-depth chat about his life and work, why the arts are fundamental to innovation across all industry sectors, and the difference between evolution and revolution in innovation. From MTF Frankfurt, this is Daniel Ray. Daniel, thanks so much for joining us on the MTF podcast. Glad to be here. Uh, you're kind of made for MTF, really. You're kind of, your, your CV is like you know, it's like a recipe for MTF. Something like that. I've I've had a weird weird path here, you know. Um, so I had a very untraditional. I always actually thought I was going to be just a musician, um, but ended up in technology. Uh-huh. Um, went through an entire path where I was focused on areas of technology completely unrelated to music. Yeah. And then started to get back into areas where I could combine music and technology. Right. And you're managing innovation for ultimate guitar. For ultimate guitar. Guitar, yeah. yeah. Guitar. And, then, and uh, I think, you know, a lot of people uh, might or might not be familiar with ultimate guitar, but in it, if, if you play guitar, you know ultimate guitar because it's, it's the largest site out there for... Uh, pretty much any type of, of, of printed music. It's over a, a one point something million tabs uh, out there. In addition to just guitar tabs, they have full transcriptions of uh, a wide number of pieces, backing tracks, all that sort of thing. A um, hundred million users, which puts Ultimate Guitar into a category uh, beyond the music industry within in those types of levels, but into all types of other social networks. I mean, it, it puts it into a category along with social networks. We've made some acquisitions of a number of other companies, uh, MuseScore, uh, most significantly yeah. and most recently, which is a community for music, uh, sheet music sharing paired with a free open source music notation editor. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, as we move forward, the future, I mean, I, I, we will continue to go into other areas that make sense. We have this crazy goal to create one billion musicians in the world. Um, wow. <laughs> so That's it, a fairly significant percentage of the population. Yeah, one in six. Yeah. One in six. And unless, you know, unless it, 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 people keep continuing to populate. Or there's some sort of global catastrophe. Global. Yeah, I, that, I, Which would make it easier. And we are, we are actually, uh, we are considering global to cat, catastrophe. I mean, we have... As a, as a strategy. As a strategy right. to, to, to reach that goal. Fantastic. Yeah. That's, that seems like good planning. Yeah. Um, so I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm one of these uh, many, many users myself. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bad guitarist. Uh, uh, and every now and then, after a couple of drinks, yeah. uh, somebody brings out a guitar and, and we do a sing-along of songs that I'm, you know, that I don't bring out ordinarily, but I know them and I know enough chords to be able to look at the the music. And your your Katy Perry song list, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and <laughs> and and the, occasionally the horse with no name, and, yes. and that's that's my kind of repertoire. Yeah. Um, but but what it does is it, it kind of uh, opens up the idea, and it's one that I'm really really super keen on, is that music doesn't have to be your job, and that there you can. Not, not that I would identify myself as a musician, but I'm somebody who can play a right, musical instrument. Right, right, right. And I, I really love this idea because, I mean, I, I think there are probably like thousands, if not millions, of people in the world who used to be in a band. And when their band didn't take off, <laughs> they stopped being musicians. Right, right. Yeah, right, and they right. kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater. And, and my take on this has always been, you know, you, you can do this for fun, you know. And that was kind of one of my, my big regrets, I guess, in life, is that it took me years to work that out. Yeah. Um, but, but you're enabling that. And I, I guess my question is, how much of the strategy of Ultimate Guitar is, is this kind of non-pro, uh, this can be for fun, this can just be with your friends or your family? Well... It's in the DNA, and, and what I mean by that is I think we should back up and, and kind of tell just briefly about 
the origin of ultimate guitar and what that, that story is. Cause that's kind of a cool, crazy story. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> it started by a guy in university. Um, he, he's wanting to learn guns and roses tabs. Only, only issue here is he's in Russia in the middle of, you know, strange little place in Russia, Kaliningrad, Russia. And you can't just go down to the guitar center or something and buy a book of tabs. He wants to learn guns and roses tabs. So what does he, what does it, what does he do? He sits in his room and he listens to the records over and over and over and over again and plunking out the tabs and transcribing them. Really proud of his work. He creates a web page because this is 1998 and that's what you do uh -huh, yeah. and puts them up there on a web page and shares it with his friends and his friends, you know, start actually adding to that, sharing their songs and then, you know, goes from Guns N' Roses to other bands and pretty soon this has this snowball effect. And what ended up happening also, there was, you know, not only this sort of ingenuity that, that got it started, but there's just the circumstances of the music industry as a whole um, are also part of that orig origin story in the sense that um, music industry has been really slow to adopt new technologies. And this is the recording side of it with Napster and all these mm -hmm. things. They were behind. And that... that uh, led to an area where there was a lot of losses in the music industry until they figured it out. You know, after Napster, they went, oh, we need to do this. And then ended up to iTunes and then streaming came about and so on. And the music industry is really healthy now, really vibrant. So <clears throat> the, the short story is basically the publishers started coming after uh, sites that were sharing. And that was easy for them to, to do that in countries like the U.S., U.K., rest of Europe. Um, but Russia is kind of an enigma for some of these publishers and not really knowing how the system works. Yeah. It became one of the last on their list of priorities. And so uh, as it happened, um, they you know, finally ended up um, being able to, to approach Ultimate Guitar and say, guys, you know, <laughs> what's up? Yeah. Uh, at, by that time, the, you know, the, the founder of the company, a really, really brilliant guy, um, he knew what was coming and rather than going and spending all that money and things, he saved it mm -hmm. to be able to turn around and cut a deal with the publishers and say, Hey guys, well, what if we made it legit? Yeah. Right. The how Spotify went and made legit. And now ultimate guitar is one of the largest licensees for some of the major music publishers. Um, and then, you know, this, these types of relationships and that expertise, um, was kind of also what naturally led to uh, the acquisition of MuseScore really making sense. It's the same thing, just a little bit broader, mm -hmm. and so on. I mean, that's so that's that's kind of the, the the background of of kind of where that comes from. And where do you come into the story? <laughs> I come into the story. I had created a, a, a company that was um, basically what we were doing is we were doing multi track. Uh, video recording for musicians where video musicians could casually create uh, videos yeah. and mash them up and it was we solved some really cool things with the video synchronization and so on um, I was in Texas at South by Southwest uh, was introduced to these guys said someone you know hey w these guys want to meet you uh -huh. and uh, really hit it off um, and then a few days later, they you know, gave an offer to the company. Say, well, what if what if you you know joined Ultimate Guitar? And they were in my office of my company six days later. And when was this? When are we talking? Almost two years ago. Okay. So um, and I <clears throat> uh, I moved there not also knowing what was in store. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd never been to Kaliningrad. I had no idea what it was. I also didn't know what was in store in terms of the full roadmap of where the, the company was going until I had already been on board. And that's, uh, that's actually a testament to them saying like, if I already jumped on then not knowing also that where things were going with Muse score and so on. And so that kind of, there was this, um, let's say very quick evolution to me transitioning into uh, a role, um, looking at Muse score, looking at the education things, and then um, very quickly uh, transitioning into the labs, you know, what, looking at, at across all the company, the products of the company, um, where is it that we should be headed 
uh, months out. And one thing that's actually been a really um, major contributing factor to the success of Ultimate Guitar is that they really focus, laser focus on the now. You know, they're thinking just barely straight ahead and they're thinking about how we can generate revenue now. And that's been a great thing for them. Um, and they'll continue to do that. But they also had this realization that we need to be thinking about the soon to be now and the not so soon to be now. Right. And, and that's what I do. I, I think about the not so soon to be now, a um, couple years out, five years out and work backwards from there. And run the innovation labs with that in mind. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Fantastic. Okay, so let's backpedal a way back. What did your parents do and how does that affect <laughs> where you've ended up? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, we can actually, here's a, we should start firstly with what my grandparents did. Sure. So, because uh, it's, it's, all, it's all connected. So, my grandfather was at Bell Labs. And so, he was a very early pioneer of computer science um, and working on uh, very massive systems uh, for the military. And so a lot of stuff he was doing with computers was quite secretive. Um, my, my, I, I think my grandma still, you know, until much later on thought he was working like a repairing Coca-Cola machines or something, something uh -huh. with machines, like yeah. in all of her, they were all the same. But he was actually building uh, computers uh, for the Navy and the, that was being used for everything related to the uh, military atomic weapons programs and things like that. So he'd be gone for quite some time off on ships in the Pacific. So they had a replica of the computer uh, also on the ship, like a, a copy, let's say. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> he would be gone doing that and then come, come back. So he did that. My father was also um, a pioneer in computer science. He, he was... Uh, for a while, uh, working with Morton Thiokol with NASA, um, doing machine control systems, so doing ignition timing and, and uh, fuel mixtures for rocket launches. And that was at the time where it was, it was split between um, uh, missiles. It was a system that was, had missiles, like MX missile and the Atlas or Hercules. So it, it, it was, he was working on technology that had a dual purpose, so military and uh, civilian. So we lived in, in, inside a military base for a while, which is kind of wild. Right, right. Um, but then he went and left that and started doing uh, automation of manufacturing plants. So he did Philip Morris. He did uh, R.J. Reynolds, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nabisco, Ford Motor, U.S. Steel, that kind of stuff. And then got back into software um, in terms of pure commercial software because uh, a couple of his buddies that he had um, from his earlier days in university, he knew some guys that had started a company, um, which was WordPerfect. Huh. So he joined WordPerfect from there. And so soft, I was always around software. I was going to say, so how on earth did you end up in the technology industry? <laughs> I, it's, it's a mystery to me. I have no idea to this day. I mean, yeah. like, have you come up with a way of weaponizing guitar tabs yet? Is that, uh, is that part of the, the roadmap? Oh, I think they're already weaponized. Right. I mean, <laughs> to, to some extent, you know, that's the beginner tabs. So. Fantastic. So when you were a kid mm -hmm. and you're growing up in this environment, uh, what are you doing? What's, kind of, uh, what's your passion? What are you uh, really into or is this just part of your environment you're not really kind of focused on it it was I thought it was normal I just thought this is what every kid did I mean we had a terminal in our house I remember uh, we had a PDP 11 in in the house when I was growing up and for like that's an ancient kind of thing and that's a, a massive mainframe computer that was connected to a bunch of terminals and so I would spend my time uh, there was a game uh, on on one of these terminals it was called dungeon and I, I loved to play it. And it was actually every installation of everything everywhere my dad did, he would, one of the things he would do is kind of an Easter egg and just kind of a fun thing. He would always install this game dungeon. And so... Uh, was this the text game? Yes, it was text-based yeah, dungeon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. And you would go and you'd create maps and there was a whole community of people that were like drawing all their maps and mm -hmm. things like this. And it was, it was a cool thing because it was a, a game that was really kind of living and growing and, and the mazes would get bigger and the territory would get bigger. Yeah. And I was really into that. And so we had a terminal at home and uh, I ended up, I was maybe about 14 years old, and I was homesick from school. And we no longer had a, a we, we moved, and 
my dad had switched uh, companies. We no longer had this uh, mainframe system in our house. You know, we had, it was actually that time as a Rainbow 100 computer, mm-hmm. a few of these, these crazy things. So um, I knew that every installation that my dad did, he would install um, this on. And so I figured out how, I, you know, if I wanted to play this game, I could just install, just log into one of my dad's installations. At this particular time, he was doing a project for U.S. Steel. And I just, I logged in um, to the system. Uh, they, it, he actually was pretty clever and he, he developed some, because it was government stuff, some intrusion detection systems and okay. detected that I wasn't him. And so we had the FBI at our house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is within, literally to their credit, within about a half an hour. Wow. Um, You're like Matthew, Matthew Broderick at this point. <laughs> the yeah. war, war games. It was, yeah. and actually the, the guy, uh, the guy who, from the FBI, he's like, this isn't war games. This isn't, you know, this. And I was like, I was just homesick and I was bored. And so, I actually was banned from uh, from touching a computer for for it was two years. Wow! wow. And yeah, <laughs> so so that's and then I was completely away from it, and then I got into music and into girls and all that stuff, and so I was. I was going to say, how did the music thing come into it? But it makes perfect sense now. If you're no longer allowed to play with computers, <laughs> yeah. you might as well pick up a guitar. Yeah. yeah. So, actually, I picked up a bassoon. Really? You know, yeah, that was my first instrument. It was bassoon because, I mean, it's. <laughs> The, the women, of course, of you course. know, you, you, the bassoon groupies are, I mean, I thought automatically you're going to get the girls. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and how did that work out for you? Oh, you know, they, they're, they're a little bit stalkery, uh-huh. you know, the bassoon groupies, all, 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 all two of them. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Do you still play? Yeah. To, to this day. I mean, I, I have right in the other room, I brought my reeds out here to this show because I'm testing out some new instruments. Fantastic. I look and forward to so that. We've already had a cello and trombone recital at, at uh, MTF Frankfurt. You, so You don't want a bassoon recital. You definitely don't. You know. we'll, we'll plug it into something. And, and, <laughs> then we'll you know, go for it. We'll, yeah. we'll glitch it for sure. Um, so, so your kind of music passion, you've, you've been able to bring that together with the technology. Did that always seem like a, a logical thing to do? No, absolutely not. Um... I, I, it was interesting because when I, when I studied in university, um, you know, I'm studying composition and we were not allowed to use computers at all, like at all. And so, uh, everything we did with composition was on a pen and paper and uh, we had a pretty rigorous, rigorous program and, and with the professors there that would, we'd take a part, uh, we'd have a part, you know, then he would, he would take the, the, the page from us and then put a blank page in front of it and say, write you know, write the part to see if, you know, if we really had this in our head. And the whole idea was that you compose in the head and putting on a paper is just a formality. So it's finished already in your head. Right. And that's a different, um, you know, with software now, you, you compose a kind of a combination of that. And the, the thinking that was in that, which is, is not the correct thinking, you know, in my, my opinion is that um, you should finish it first and then put it on paper but with the type of of fantastic play playback and all these other things you can do and and the the different types of exploration virtual orchestrations and things you can do you know you should compose you know in your head compose in the software compose in collaborative and things there's there's it's 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 not a static thing anymore right. you know yeah I, and and to an extent i don't think it ever was i mean i'm i do write you know, i do a lot of writing and i always say you know how could i possibly know what i think until i see what i've written exactly you know and and so the actual kind of uh you know putting it into some sort of tangible form or at least sort of visible form is part of how you work things out uh, absolutely and it's 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 uh, also these these old school purists who were so much more focused on the process than the result, you know, and that's that, you know, I, I think about how many great composers have gone on to other career or potentially great composers have gone on to other careers or other paths because the process didn't fit them. You know, they could create, had a great result, but the process didn't fit them. And so that takes a lot of things coming back into Muse score. I mean, I take a lot of that experience into this and say, you know, how do we support the workflow? How do we support the process? Mm -hmm. And how do we support the different levels, the needs of the different levels or the different, you know, types of outcomes that people want? Um, Not everyone that wants to create is a, is a professional composer Mm -hmm. and not everyone should be, you know, but everyone should have the ability to create and, and to have tools that, that help them 
uh, create at the minimum to their current level. Uh, ideally, the tools should allow them to exceed their natural abilities. Tell me about the labs. What happens? <laughs> what we do actually is um, we don't really produce something tangible. Like what we do is we have a process where we, we create ideas, we create concepts. Um, some of those concepts based upon timing of things, other things that are going on with the existing products, we take and bring it into maybe uh, uh, re- we explore the products, the projects or the concepts, ideas a little bit further. Um, we validate them. We do research, we do validation, and then we might get it to um, mock-ups and then to maybe a, a prototype or a proof of concept. And with these MVPs, you know, they're a minimum viable product that we might create. Then we do some sort of market validation. And then uh, if it moves through the market validation sort of successfully in that, then the process it passes to become a feature of another product, it becomes uh, another product itself within the company, or it could even potentially become another company. Right. Right. So, so you're now here at MTF Labs, yeah. and you kind of see, I, I guess, what we do is somewhat different to what you do in your labs. Uh, what are you seeing that's kind of interesting to you? Well, it's, it's int- what, what is interesting, the most interesting thing here is we try to do something that has at least some sort of commercial purpose. You know, that's, that's what's really different here. And the things that here, you're, you're not thinking of things from a commercial perspective, right? And so you just, it's wide, wide open, and you do it just because it's cool, you know? (laughs) And when I look at these things, immediately I'm seeing, well, they're not trying to be commercial and they're not trying to do stuff, but, oh man, I see some commercial opportunities right now already. So, I mean, looking even just today, spending some time with some of these uh, projects and seeing what they're doing, even if there's not a commercial intent, I see uh, an immediate commercial opportunity for, for several of these things. And, and I want to be, I want to be kind of cautious about how I say this because I think when in in the sense that everyone gets a kind of on on edge uh, when you talk about commercial opportunities in in anything in the arts, whether it's music or you know, dance or visual arts or anything like that, and they say, oh well, that that's that's diluting it, that's destroying it, that's this, and and I don't believe that because I don't think it's a choice either or. Uh, I think you can have some wildly creative and wildly uh, free and very commercially viable products mm-hmm. you know, that you can create that that are artistic yeah. and and it's just imagine you know you just it, it's just about how your imagination is you know and in terms of of how you can imagine ways to do that that don't entirely dilute the intent or dilute the purpose right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, if I look at the idea of, um, you know, people always use the, the, this metaphor of, oh, well, you know, you're commoditizing and it's, you're making McDonald's out of, you know, the McDonald's of music. It's like, sometimes McDonald's is pretty good. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, there are scenarios. I mean, everything has its own purpose in its own way and the 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 great thing is that the very commercially successful things are what allow the ability to support the more artistic endeavors yeah. and, and a lot of times the broader market is introduced to the ability to create and their own ability their own personal ability to create or perform through things that are very commercial because that's how the commercial things are what gets the exposure. And through that, they start to learn more and more and more, and they dive into deeper into the less commercial things. So the more commercial things and more commercial efforts are essential to non-commercial art. And I think the inverse reply uh, applies as well, which is kind of what you've seen, I think, is if you don't put, all right, I want you guys to make something that will make a fortune, uh, as, as kind of the goal of this, what you do get, you put creativity at the center of it Absolutely. and the ideas that Absolutely. spring out of that, obviously you're, you're seeing, oh my God, I could, you know, I, I could do that. I could, <laughs> I could, do I could make that. a yeah. fortune <laughs> with that one. Yeah. Um, but that, that is part of the intention of what we're doing is not, you know, how can we kind of create businesses, but, but how can the ideas that start here go on to have a life beyond it and not just kind of be left on the floor and everybody goes home and congratulates themselves. Right, and so right. the idea 
of sustainability of, of uh, the endeavor is, is something that's quite important to us here. So that it's no surprise to us that, that actually when you, put, <laughs> when you put creativity in the center of it and people kind of have these wild and crazy ideas, you right. look at it and go, you know what, inside that is something that's really potentially commercially valuable. Right. And right. You could sort of make, you could, this could be your job now. Um, and, and actually to me, that's a, that's a really great outcome, particularly because it's not putting the cart before the horse and going, all right, so to start with, how can I make the most possible money and then try and invent something around it? Because all you're ever going to get that way is kind of incremental innovation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and this is what we deal with when we talk about incremental innovation. We very much deal with the evolution versus revolution. Ah. Um, and the product teams inside the company are dealing with evolution. And they're, I mean, Fantastic, and 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 they are, the evolution is at a very rapid pace in some of these things, whereas what the labs do, does is deals with revolution mm-hmm. in that. But bringing it back to the MTF labs here, if you had people from the standpoint here starting out saying, "Hey, you know, make something commercially viable," they're going to have in their head already ideas of within the parameters or close to the parameters of something that's already in the market. It's going to be evolutionary, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Not, not uh, Evolutionary, not revolutionary. And so when you say, hey, do it for art, you're going to just do <laughs> what what's cool and what feels good, but you're going to stumble into some things that are going to be truly viable, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe not in the initial incar- incarnation, but it's going to start a, a chain reaction of something that that if they keep at it, there will be ways that, that that's what you know, they're going to do, be able to, to, to make a solid living from it. And yeah, and, that, and the, the really kind of simple version of that is if you make something just because you want to see it exist in the world, chances are there are going to be other people who want to see want it, to exist. it exist. Exactly. 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 Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, phase. So, okay, take me from your, you know, your... Uh, bassoon hero days <laughs> yeah. uh, to to where you are now. What sort of what's what am I missing in between those things? In between those things, so um, what ended up happening is this is the time when the internet just started really taking off, and we saw people that didn't understand it, and they're like, it's it might have might as well have been to them like a, just a moon launch or something like that, you know, Mm -hmm. and particularly large companies. And uh, I said, well, okay, I I should look at this and see what the, you know, see how this stuff works. And this is the end days of, um, you know, the NCSA mosaic browser, you know, still at, at, uh, in, in, in from the university that, uh, or banish champagne or something like that. And so before even Netscape, came out yeah and i was like okay well, i can see what this is about and so i got a book to learn html and i'm just like that's it <laughs> really yeah. that's it all right cool and i it i it, it even felt kind of we decided that that, that 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 there was a commercial opportunity here people thought it was like this crazy you know, difficult thing, and it was actually this pretty black arts. <laughs> yeah, this is cr- it's pretty easy, and then and and you'll pay me money for this too, and it felt a little bit weird even taking their money, like I was cheating them or something. But they didn't know, you know, how to do this. We knew how to do it, and so we started. I started a consulting firm um, that was doing simple web development that became more and more complex. Um, then uh, at the evolution of that. Um, ended up being getting into other opportunities as mobile technologies emerged um, and being able to, for the first time, to combine um, my interests in composition uh, with technology and things that were, you know, roughly related to the internet and, and that sort of thing with ringtones. All right. So when you had these MIDI monophonic ringtones and stuff, we were, we were making them. And we made the, the ringtones, and we also made the infrastructure um, for being able to deliver those to the phones. It was originally the Nokia infrastructure, you know, being able to send those out there. And that also got me into the understanding the music licensing business mm-hmm. with ringtones and how all that worked. Um, and because the commercial opportunities of that continued to evolve... Uh, the companies that we were dealing with doing the ringtones, how it, how it, it actually started is 
uh, it, there was a brand that we were working with that wanted to, a soft drink brand that wanted to work um, with us to deliver as a part of a campaign for, uh, on, on, they would have a, on top of the, the, the screw top cap, a code that you could enter and you could get a ringtone for free. And that set us down a path of doing mobile marketing solutions. And so we started working with large multinational brands with mobile marketing, which was Kraft, Nestle, uh, Coca-Cola, all, all these big uh, brands we moved into uh, dealing from that a larger a, a larger number of uh, activities that we had, you know, in terms of not just mobile, getting into mobile web, getting into, um, then we ended up doing camp, full campaign life cycles and then tracking you. We created a campaign management software from that. Um, that would track them across different campaigns. We were doing it for HP, for Dell. Uh, we did it for 7-Eleven, um, and then retailers like Costco and Office Max and so on. So we, we built that company up uh, and then ended up selling that company. Mm. Um, and after selling that company, I um, started looking at what are the next things to do. And I had time to and kind of freedom to be able to think about that, you know, not really a sense of urgency and started to look at ways to combine music and technology together again and utilizing the other experiences that I had with mobile mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And that's how we end up moving into that path. And video was your sort of first yeah. uh, combination. Oh, combination. That, that was your first idea or were there a few things that... Uh... Um, we started on a, an early path of exploring concepts for... Uh, taking the same thing that we were doing with campaign management, um, which was essentially managing relationships and interaction. It's kind of a, a, a really advanced CRM type of solution that, that, that could also do tracking across multiple types of things. And we said, okay, musicians, the music industry it's, as a whole is really bad at being organized. You know, what are areas we could, we could start with them in organizing? It was a passion sort of project um, that we created that was... F managing school music programs, uh, software for school music programs. Mm -hmm. And how the video thing came about is we had some music educators that were saying, hey, I want uh, to have my students, can your platform have my students on their mobile phone be able to record a uh, performance of their piece and I can see it and to be able to, to, to see their progress and give them feedback. Uh -huh. And that's where we said, okay, well, let's, we'll see it. And then they, the request got more complicated. Well, can it, can it be with an accompaniment or maybe a duet together? And we're like, okay, well, maybe. And so we understood from that that there was a much broader commercial opportunity um, beyond just the music education segment for that. But uh, even, even to more casual users and users that were kind of very aligned with ultimate guitar. Right. And that's how, that's how that ended up, you know, ended up happening. I mean, it's a lot of times it just, you know, things like that just kind of naturally evolve. And so now at ultimate guitar, you're doing hackathons on a fairly um, regular basis. Or? So I, I spend a lot of time personally, um, going to some of these things. Some's not, not really related to music but related to, uh, general activities and technology. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, a lot of the you know, startup weekend type of things, um, the things that are done uh, with tech stars and um, different places. And I, I've done that in a number of places I did a, a, with the USAID uh, also for a while, um, going to developing economies to where there'd be a program. We, I, I created an initiative to, to kind of open source the idea of the information that, that, that young entrepreneurs should have access to. So if I kind of went back and said, okay, what are all the mistakes that I made? And what are all the things that I wish I would have known starting out? Um, and then ask that same thing of other entrepreneurs that I knew. And we tried to, to, to organize and categorize this information and open source it and then localize it and got the idea of... The point was that, you know, I saw... Um, some articles in, uh, about one of the biggest challenges in developing economies were, was the issue of brain drain. Right, in, right, in yeah. 
the best and brightest were going there and, and how could you create initiatives to, to get them to stay? And that led me to, by chance, to some other relationships which ended up connecting with me with USAID. And then USAID sponsored this program and I ended up in Kazakhstan and Kosovo and Moldova and uh, all these countries that I probably never would have thought to visit and had some fantastic experiences and then uh, would spend time in these countries uh, where the pro programs were funded by USAID. And I made a sort of a deal with them is if I go to these countries, I would have equal time that I'd spend with the entrepreneurs as well as young musicians in the, the, those countries. And so I was doing master classes at the Philharmonia um, in uh, Almaty, Kazakhstan. I was doing uh, music school for you know young elementary school kids in in Moldova and and so on, and getting opportunities to do that kind of stuff. And um, because I think it's important, and this this comes back to innovation in general. And everyone focuses so much on the idea of innovation is r driven by engineering, and it's driven by math, and it's driven by science, but it's not. It's driven by all those things plus a combination of the arts. Because if you don't have the arts in there, you don't have the creative thinking and this type of very abstract problem solving and the idea of doing stuff just because you like it, mm -hmm. because you love it. That's, that's what innovation truly is. So it's innovation is a combination of these things. And everyone's talking about buzzwords of how those things are. There's steam. Steam, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, adding the A in there. And that's okay. If that gets the job done, that gets the job done. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, um, but I, I think that it's, it is essential. You know, and the, the arts are absolutely essential to, to innovation. And you see that in cultures that do that have strong emphasis on engineering but do not have the same emphasis on the arts those are cultures where they're very good at cloning not so good at innovating right right and so that's uh, I, and and i think that it's that's starting to people are starting to figure that out do you think that that whole thing globally speaking is getting better yes no question yeah um, it's getting different but it's also getting better. I mean, the idea, and this comes back to the whole mission of things with Ultimate Guitar, with MuseScore and so on, this idea of one billion musicians. The internet opens up the ability to have access to information that is globally and equally available. Right. You could be in rural Pakistan and you have access to the exact same set of information someone in midtown Manhattan has. Exactly. I think it's it's uh, it's one thing to solve the information gap. It's probably another thing to convince people to practice. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, actually, you know, <laughs> it's strange that you brought that up because the point of it is is that's actually one product that we have now. It's called Melodic, uh, M E L O D I Q, and it's a video game based practice app. Right. And it basically it starts it writes it's available for guitar right now, mm -hmm. and. It is making practice fun, right? It's chocolate covered broccoli, right? <laughs> you know, it is, it is, it is, it's, you're, you are getting all the benefits of the broccoli, but it's still chocolate. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, I, it, it's, it's fun, it's engaging and it's, it's not quite as simple as, you know, the buzzword of everything, everyone's saying gamify this or gamify that. It is, it's saying here is something. How do we think about the idea of how we can completely uh, transform how to develop this um, this process? You know, of the skills development process, make it a game where you accidentally develop those skills. By you know, the purpose of the game is not to develop those skills. The de skills are developed as an outcome of the game. Right. You're basically tricking people into becoming better musicians. Chocolate covered broccoli. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Fantastic. So, what's your what's your outcome here now that you're at Music Tech Fest? You're involved in the labs. Uh, how do you walk away from this going? Well, that was worthwhile. I I already have. I mean, from the same point, I already have because I, I I have I have ideas uh, of things. I oh, also some some guys that are here developing some things. I will continue to to connect with them after this and do this. So it's already been valuable. I had 
absolutely no idea what to expect. And it was really kind of ambiguous, you know, the, the definition of, of, of this. And I think that's by design uh-huh. as well. I mean, it's, it's designed to, to have that sense of, of, of freedom. But what I see here is also what's interesting is, is there is no specific, when you go to like a lot of hackathons, they put people into boxes or channels. Okay, you're a UX designer, you're a marketing person, you are a back end, a front end of this. Here it's like, you're a human. <laughs> what do you want to do? Yeah. How, how are you going to contribute? Sure. You know? and, and you see that people are contributing in very, very different ways that you wouldn't see in a normal hackathon. And also the motivations, I think, are very, very different. Um, in in uh, the, a lot of these hackathons, people are, are, they have a personal commercial intent in it. They're, they're either wanting to make relationships that will get them to, to transfer to a new job or that sort of thing, or they want to build a, a startup company that will be viable. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not focused on doing it just for the love of doing it. And I think we lose a lot of, of that, particularly in American culture, I, I would say. We don't do enough stuff just to do it. Just because we love it, right? It always has to have a reason. Not everything has to have a reason. <laughs> Why? Well, just do. Do you like it? Yeah. Well, it, welcome to my world. Do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, exactly. <laughs> well, one, I mean, I was a I was a judge on the South by Southwest Hackathon this year. Okay. Yeah. And uh, one of the criteria that we were given was, you know, with the commercial viability of this idea. Right. It's like, right. Hang on, they've only thought of this in the last last twenty four hours or, or twelve hours. Right. You know, give it a chance. I, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting you bring that up is there was, um, you know, when you, you go through some of these things, when on the side of these judges and the lenses that they look through things and, and with something like South by Southwest, you have a number of people that all have ran different opinions on mm-hmm. stuff when, when you're judging those things and it, the results come out to be just an average of, of, of the, the, the opinions. Mm-hmm. And so when I, I look at some of the things that are, that have come out of that, that have won that, I scratch my head. Yeah. Um, but we've actually acquired, uh, we, we recently acquired a company that, that, that came out of that. Yeah. Uh, out of, out of one of those, uh, ha- the hackathons at South by Southwest. Right. Um, you know, they were there and uh, they didn't win. I don't think they were in the top five, right? But we bought them, so I think they're the top one on our list. So. Fantastic. Well, CJ, who's here at uh, MTF uh, Frankfurt, yeah. was uh, in the winning team of the uh, South by Southwest Hackathon. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And uh, and one of my concerns uh, during the judging, because there were seven judges, and yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. because there was a real kind of satirical. Uh, almost kind of performance art element to what mm-hmm. CJ was doing. You've met CJ, yeah, so yeah, you can kind yeah. of imagine this. Um, but what I was worried was these other judges aren't going to get this because this is this is basically a critique of essentially this kind of thing. And uh, I thought, so he's probably. I'm, I mean, I'm scoring him really highly because I think this right. is amazing. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but I, you know, maybe they're not going to score him as highly because they might not, you know, quite get, get it. it from, from they you know, because they're looking it. at it from a particular, you know, uh, Lens of, uh, exactly from they're from major record labels. They're from kind of you know big uh, broadcasting companies. So they're kind of looking at it from a particular lens. And what was really interesting is they scored it as highly as I did, and mm. they didn't get it. Which was, <laughs> which, yeah, was yeah, yeah. which was really amazing. So, so they actually saw the com- com- uh, commercial potential in the thing that was actually satirical of the things with commercial potential. So, it, you know, and one thing to, to, to kind of bring up after also having conversations with him, uh, you know, directly and uh, about an individual, it's also in some of these cases, it's you, you, you may not see the commercial intent or the commercial potential of that particular idea, but you do see a particular commercial intent or potential of that person. Sure. And an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. Whatever, you know, if if, you, if an entrepreneur tells you they're going to retire, that's funny. You know, <laughs> it's not going to, I mean, it's never going to happen because sure. if you have one idea, you have 1,000 ideas. Yeah. And I mean, you, so when you, when you speak to VCs, they go, just back the rider. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's, it might not be the right horse. But right. back, the, back the rider, right? Because you're gonna you can switch horses. Yeah, you can you can absolutely switch horses, switching jockeys, 
much more difficult, you know, because uh-huh. so, um, and, you know, I, I think that's the opportunity, you know, I, I've been through that on, on both sides of that, on from the venture capital side of it. And I, you know, raising money, we, 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 the original idea that we raised money on was not what we ended up, you know, we, it's some form or variation, you know, and the idea of, you know, sticking you know, to a hard and fast business plan of something that you just, like a, from a hackathon or something you did, that's like, that's like getting married from the, on the first Tinder date, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. So um, you, you kind of need to feel things out and see where they go. And the other thing is that the market is not static either. Sure. The market's changing. I mean, all these people who, uh, I mean, all these companies, you know, that say that they were out there that, that had the best incredible physical keyboard at the time the iPhone came out, yeah. <laughs> you know, Blackberry, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Black. I mean, the iPhone, the, the concept of Blackberry, which was so well loved when you compare it to an iPhone, it just seems archaic. And also likewise from the opposite direction, had you asked people if they want a screen without buttons, they would thought you were crazy. Exactly. I thought you were completely crazy. But that goes back to this idea of evolution versus revolution. Mm-hmm. And you need activities where you're free to fail, where you're free to explore, you're free to create f- for just the purpose of doing it um, to, to arrive at these revolutionary ideas. And without that freedom, you're, you're just going to have a constant evolution. You know, and, and constant evolution is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, we have the platypus, you know. How did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> because on paper, that's not a great idea. It's not a great idea. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I just, I would have never, I mean, that's like pickles and peanut butter. Uh-huh. Why? How would, that, how would that ever happen? So now that you're here, and you're here for the 24 hours yeah. of, the, of the kind of the, I, I guess the sort of the stripped down MTF labs, because normally this is a multi-day event that right, we do. Right, right, right. Um, but uh, here at Music Master in Frankfurt, we're doing this sort of 24-hour version of the MTF labs. Are you making yourself useful? Are you, 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 what are you working on? Um, what I've been doing right now is actually, I mean, how I feel like I'm making myself most useful um, and I hope it's, it's, it's of use to some of these guys is, is going around to really get to an understanding of what each, each of these teams are doing and not only what the teams are doing, but what the individuals are doing, like what excites them, what's, what's interesting to them. And, and one of the guys I, I was talking to about a particular project he was working on, um, he said, you know, he was showing me some code from something and he says, oh, uh, but that's from another thing. And he showed me another thing he was doing. I was like, wow, that's really good. Yeah, but that's from another thing. You know, <laughs> that's part of this other thing. And, and I was just like, hold on, stop. And I, I said, what's your GitHub? And I just went and sat and spent, you know, some time on his GitHub. And it was fantastic. I wow. mean, he's got a lot of great projects. And so that also brings it back to that idea. If you have one idea, you have, you, you have, uh, you have a thousand ideas. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think the the thing that I'm getting out of it is is getting to know these individuals, getting to know the teams, and hopefully giving them some at least some sort of feedback on on you know some of the things that they're doing, and seeing if it's you know just from the random weird things that I've run across that might you know spark an idea in them, uh, or you know get them to to uh, maybe you know jump some gaps in some of the things they're working on. What's the roadmap for you personally? What what uh, are you looking forward to or, or developing next uh, in, in your sort of career path? Because it seems like it has rapid jumps of uh, <laughs> you know, sort of next thing, next thing, next thing. What's yeah. the next thing? This is this is the next thing. I mean, this is this is the th- I'm, I'm I'm I think this is this is where I'm at, and um, it's one of those things where I I get I get to do the coolest things every day and. The structure, the freedom that I have to do this is, uh, it's really idea driven. And so there's not the pressure of, of being, uh, you know, tied to timelines for mm-hmm. getting a product out. I don't have that stress of an entrepreneur thinking about oh, how to make payroll, how to do this. I get to do the fun parts. Like I get to, you know, I get to, to eat all the ice cream, you know, and I, I have, I, that's, that's. Uh, the, the stuff that I'm doing right now, I mean, the main things I'm working on 
right now and for the next little bit that are really, really cool. Um, completely, you know, reimagining what Muse score can be. You know, in term, from the uh, experience, you know, end to end. So from creation to distribution to consumption, um, looking at the fantastic things we have now. And by the way, this has also been a really interesting thing to dive into the open source world. Because I, I, prior to this, I had no... I had no real connection to the open source world and I, I, I already had some prejudices about it without spending the time there because I was just thinking, well, why do that? Because there's not this commercial viability. You Where's the extrinsic motivation? Yeah, and yeah. you don't own the source code and you can't do this. And it's like, but it's got me to really rethink some of those things and think, well, actually there's really some fantastic ways to make, uh, you know, t- to, to make revenue in open source. It's not direct you know, but they're indirect ways, and you have a type of um, development and type of customer relationship that's very, very different. You know, it's like everyone. It's when when someone says, "Like, what if?" and then if it's followed by, "I can." You know, that's the thing. What if well, you can? Right. <laughs> what if you can? You want it? Do it. You know, if, if users ask for features or request features, it's just like, awesome, do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, it's a very different sort of interaction. You meet a lot of really great and really passionate people. Um, so that's, that's been a new thing. And so it also has a new set of challenges. So how, how do you, as a company... Um, how do you manage um, the expectations and manage the relationships of the really uh, uh, um, um, very important, very valuable, and very amazing contributors, very generous with their time and their expertise, and getting to understand and know their motivations for why they do it. And it's uh, it goes back to doing you know the, everything we've been talking here. That's that's also the open source community. The open source community is doing it for the love of it, doing it for they want to see <laughs> if they can do that, how that can happen. There's an, each individual has a different set of motivations, but um, you know the idea here is saying, okay, what, well, what do we have now? What are the raw materials that we have? Where do we want to be in five years, in three years? And what are the steps to take and, and, and work towards that, you know, from the, moving back backwards and... The other thing is, like, what are entirely new product categories we can come up with? Mm-hmm. What are entirely new things we can come up with? What, what does actual digital music mean? Because digital music creation in terms of notation, everyone is still stuck in the idea of paper. And every software is stuck in this idea of this, this paper paradigm. And even if they're doing digital distribution, they're distributing digital paper. Right, it's PDF, and it's like we're not taking advantage of digital. It's a fix. We're 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 creating f- for a fixed a fixed format. Yeah, yeah, and not using the affordances of the medium. Yeah, and and digital is truly ethereal. It doesn't have. You don't have to assign it a format. And so the idea, you know, when I, I was in the uh, these meetings today, this other discussion with the um, WC three uh, music notation community group and they're talking about this new standard and the new future and I was like guys guys stop stop you're trying to create it's like you're trying to create a new digital format for cassette tape <laughs> you know okay how are we going to new digital encoding format for cassette tape forget that cassette tape exists every other medium out there that is a digital format doesn't have any concept of fixed format Right, you don't have MP3s that are designed to. Oh well, this MP3 format will fit on an LP. Right. <laughs> you know. Okay. What, what, what does that matter? And uh, and I think it's a failure of the companies that are producing the consumption side. We have to solve the consumption problem. Yeah, it's like a digital album that has side two. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's, it's a, flip your phone over. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So the problem that we have is it's a consum. It's it's. it's where we have not solved the consumption problem in a way that is truly digital native. So because of that, 
is a problem because those solutions are not compelling enough. We are still, we're still creating for these older fixed formats. And um, a metaphor that comes to mind here in this, and and also, uh, you know, uh, something to learn from this idea is that, so my brother, if you talk about the family and how all these impacts are in the family. So uh, my brother, he was at Microsoft for 12 years and um, he's a UX designer and you know he one of the things when we talk about evolution versus revolution um, sometimes revolution is hard because those that are not ready for that revolution don't get it um, and they want something familiar right. right occasionally there are resistances to revolutions you know in, uh, yeah. in other spheres as well and I, I get it I get it because also I mean like I, I grew up skiing right and I like to ski and I decided to try, oh, I'm going to try snowboarding. And I had new pain. I, I wasn't good at it. I wasn't in control. And I was like, I don't have a limited, I have a limited time to do this. This sucks. I want to go back to skiing. So that's uh, the, the same um, idea here, right? But if had I, had I started out on snowboard and I went through the initial pain on snowboard, I'd probably love snowboarding. So the, the point is, is so he designed uh, Windows 8, so right. all those little squares and those boxes and the Metro interface, that's his, that's right. his baby. So he did that. Um, like he's the sole inventor on the, the, the patent and, and all that. And they had this idea that they would test it on kids. And it's so easy that oh, the three year old can just go in and they can sit in front of it and intuitively in, in a matter of seconds, they understand how it works and they can operate it. But you put a, a, a three-year-old kid with a mouse, and you have to click, and you have to read, and, to- and they're not going to—they're not going to arrive at that point. And so, they tested it all on kids, and they said, "Look at how amazing it is! A kid can understand it in a second. Yeah, but they didn't test it on adults, <laughs> and it was the problem was the adults didn't get it, and the adults wanted to go back. They wanted to ski again. They don't want to snowboard. They want the start button." Yeah. And they want to go back to that. And lists of words that pop up. <laughs> that's what they want. They want to read. They want it, you know, they want a, an, they want a more cumbersome, awkward interface that, that, you know, that they understand. And so it, that's a really, really interesting, um, you know, metaphor there. And he actually, after that, that was his, his, his last thing there. And he went on to, um, to, to, to go on to, now he's at Google and he's been there and there for a while, but, um, it's an interesting idea. So when we look at the digital native formats, we look at paper and I had a, I had a discussion with some of the publishers while I was here at this event and talking with them and they're like, paper's never going to die. Paper's never going to die. And I was like, you know what? You're going to die. <laughs> you're really going to die. And that's fine because, and I said, well, here's the point when you're going to die, you know, in this, all, all of us are going to die, but we're going to be replaced by something. Mm-hmm. And we're not, like we're not immediately replaced by something, you know, completely mature as, as we die. But meaning that, that we should focus on these new interfaces, on newer generations, these digital natives, these new interfaces and new concepts. Okay, cool. Paper. Awesome. Sure. It, you stay with that. Yeah. This, this isn't for but you. a hundred years from now, all new people. Yeah, and yeah. we're gonna have all. We already have all new people. Yeah. You know, we have new people. We don't need. You know, you stay with paper. Uh-huh. When you die, paper dies with you. Right, that's fine. That's cool. We're gonna phase it out, but that's the the point. Is like when we who do we create for? Are we creating for the whole entire audience and people that have their fixed ways? If 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 here's the thing. If 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 Windows would have if they had said, okay, you know what? Here's this interface. And this interface here is for everyone under 25. <laughs> and here's the interface. It's the same software. It's compatible. It does everything. And here's for everyone over 25. Uh, it it would have worked. And they actually tried that, that hybrid thing for a right. while. Okay. But the idea of with what I see the opportunity with us and what we're creating is to say, hey, we're, we're not going to design these interfaces for these guys that are all uh, caring about paper and this be- paper metaphor and these things. We're going to design for this next generation. And they're going to grow with us, you know, and they're going to evolve with us and we're going to design for them. And with MuseScore, 67% of our users are under the age of 24. Wow. Which really? is wild. That's insane. It's insane. 12 million users and 7,000 new downloads per day. And we really haven't gotten into the education segment in, 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 in a meaningful way. Right. And as we do that, I see, I see us pushing 80% of our users being under that age. And that's who we're going to create for. Mm-hmm. 
And that's going to give us opportunities to explore new paradigms for this digital native. And, and I think that also becomes an interesting idea of you can take revolutionary versus evolutionary risks when you have the ability that your market would potentially go along with you. And if these guys with paper, if that's not really our market, right? And stats tell us that that's not. Yeah. We don't care. Love paper all you want. Yep. Do origami. We don't care. You know, that's not, you're not our audience. And that's a, a weird thing to do when you get into, you know, these discussions with uh, guys that are creating for composers to distribute for paper. And they're in that world. Because when you think of sheet music, you think of classical musicians, you think of paper. Paper. Yeah. Yeah. But what if sheet music is streaming? Yeah. Like, why does it have, I mean, like, think about the concept of music streaming. That's the next evolution past the MP3, right? Well, sheet music exists in time and space. But right now, our concept of sheet music just exists in space. It doesn't exist in time. And if you think about it, there's all these symbols and all these, these things in music notation that are about compromises between the idea of time and space, right? If you have limited space and unlimited time, well, you add in repeat symbols and jumps and all these things. Well, if you have unlimited time and unlimited space, well, that con you don't need those anymore. Right. The process becomes simplified. And the idea of the level of knowledge that you need to create notated music also changes because as you create smarter systems, so let's say the idea of paper goes away. So paper goes away. Well, all these rules about engraving and how placement of things are, and there's this, there's really a cult, like a serious religion around music notation engraving. And the reality is that algorithms are a lot better at that than humans and a lot more efficient. And why should humans re waste their time, their energy and intellectual capacity on that when they could spend their time creating more music? You know, who, who's like, who thinks about, oh man, I, I, I did the best engraving today. Oh, uh, engravers, engravers do. Yeah. But anyone beyond that doesn't sit, sit like, like, wow, this is beautifully engraved pieces. And when you have digital format, it becomes fluid. You know, because it's good, you have a mobile phone and you have your music on your mobile phone, you have music on a computer, on a tablet, on this. It's going to be different for each format. It's going to be optimized um, for each individual, uh, the constraints of each individual device. Mm -hmm. And that's, these are the fun challenges. When you go back, to bringing you back to what I get to do all day yeah. is imagine the w world where it can be, not necessarily where it currently is. Right. right? And you get to break shit along the way. <laughs> okay, so now that you've come here yeah. uh, to an MTF and you had a taste of it, uh, can we get you back? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, Fantastic. absolutely. Daniel, thanks so much for your time. All right, take care. Cheers. That's Daniel Ray, Head of Innovation for Ultimate Guitar. And that's the MTF Podcast. If there was anything in there that's of interest to you and you think you might want to get involved in what we do, you can sign up at the MTF website. Just go to musictechfest.net slash register. And if there was anything in there that might be of interest to someone you know, make sure you share it with them. That's it for now. Have a great week, and we'll talk soon. Cheers.